you got your, we got any other announcements to make? Oh, yeah. Uh, next week is a patch holders meeting, and if you're a patch holder here, you're required to be here. It's mandatory. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how this ministry began and everything else, and we want you to be a part of it. Amen? If you've got your Bibles, it's right. Do you have an announcement to make, Michelle? Right after church, a scholarship committee. Do you have another announcement to make? It was an honor to have it here. But, you know, they always tell me what a good funeral I do. And I was joking with them. I said, honestly, though, I never wanted to be known as the death guy. I wanted to be the life guy, you know what I'm saying? But uh, it's an honor at any time you can give somebody a celebration of life. Amen? So this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I will do what it says I can do. Today I'll be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. And I'll never be the same. Never, never, never. Never be the same. In Jesus' name. Amen. I want to start out by saying this. This was a post by a friend on, on uh, what? Are you going to come up here and say it, or is everybody going to have to guess what's going on? Okay, what? Amen. Thank you. Thank you. There was a post on uh, Facebook by a friend that said, uh, no matter what you're going through, uh, you may be struggling in a particular sin, but come to church. And I loved it. Because maybe you've heard me preach about different sins. You say, well, I, I'm not going to go to church because i got a problem with that. No. First of all, I want to tell you the difference between struggling with sin and rebellion. Some people struggle with a particular sin, but they're not in rebellion. And they want to get better. We want you here. Amen? So no matter what it is, remember, this is not a group of people that don't have problems. If anybody in the world is screwed up, it's us. <laughs> but we have a great God, and we're doing the best we can with the tools we got. Amen? And we're worshiping Jesus, and we're getting better all the time. Amen? Amen. So when you know a friend say, well, I'd, I'd go to church, but I, I just got some things I need to change, you just tell him, well, welcome to the group. Amen. We're all changing. Amen? Amen? I'm so glad I'm saved. But I don't want to be just saved. I'm glad of that. I'm glad my name's written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. But I want to live a victorious life on this side of heaven. Amen. He said, uh, uh, the thief comes but to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that you might have life, that you might have it more abundantly. I want the abundant life. I want to continue living uh, uh, as a Christian, and I want to experience every good thing that God has for me. And uh, there are a whole bunch of people in this world that really uh, are really not sure. I, I run on to them all the time. How do I know I'm saved? Well, you do know if you're saved, but, but I want to just tell you this little story. I thought it was a pretty good illustration. There was a gal that got on a train here in Kansas City, was headed to St. Louis. So she got on the train. She had never ridden a train before. She sat down. She thought, I wonder if this is really going to St. Louis. I'd hate to get on the wrong train. So she asked the gal behind her. She said, listen, uh, uh, am I on the train that's going to St. Louis? And she goes, yeah, this is the right train. And she thought about it. Maybe she's on the wrong train too. Who knows? And so she said to people across the aisle, ah, listen, am I on the train that's going to St. Louis? And, and they said, yes, you're, you're on the right train. And so uh, uh, she kind of struggled with it for a second. Well, maybe they don't know anything either. And so finally the conductor was coming down the aisle. She goes, am I on the train to go into St. Louis? 
He goes, you're on the right train. I'm the conductor. I'm telling you this is the right train, and I will make sure to get you where you're going. Well, can I tell you? That's the problem with people. They want to ask their friends whether or not they think they're saved. You think I'm saved? Don't ask your friends. Don't ask your husband or wife. It's a personal relationship between you and God. And if you know the conductor of this train, he's going to get you where you're supposed to go. Amen? So I want to tell you, you are, you are saved. You, if you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're saved. You're not in and out of salvation. When you're saved, you're saved. That's it. Amen? And, uh, but I want to live a victorious life. I don't want to just be saved. I want to live a victorious life. And there's a story we've been talking about in our Wednesday night Bible study. And uh, uh, we've been talking about Abraham lately. And we're going to talk about him a little bit there because... Uh, uh, there is a name that we're going to, there, there are the redemptive names of God. One of the redemptive names of God is Jehovah Jireh. And over the next few weeks, I want to kind of talk about some of those redemptive names. Did you know that when you got saved, God didn't reveal everything he was to you at that point of salvation? You couldn't have handled it. That's why we need to renew our mind through the word of God and keep drawing close to God and finding out more wonderful things about him. Amen. And how do we know that there's more and more wonderful things? I like it when we have, when in Isaiah, when it talks about the vision of he had of worship in heaven. And, uh, uh, and he said the angels were going around the presence of God, and they would go, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And then they'd get around to another part of it, and they'd say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. Why did they keep saying it? You know why? Because as they circled the presence of God, they kept seeing more Wonderful things, wonderful things about our God. As you grow in the Lord, you're going to find more and more wonderful things about God. You know, you can't judge God by what you see out here in the world. You can't. And there, I, I, I have run on to people who said, I won't go to church and I won't serve God. But if I talk to them long enough, I'll find out they had somebody that died that they'd prayed for or they were treated badly in a church. You can't judge God by Christians. You should be able to, you're supposed to be able to do that, but it doesn't work out. And why? Because we're all working on drawing closer to Christ and becoming what God would have us to be. Amen? Now, I know I'm saved, but I need some improvement, right, Debbie? <laughs> she's thrilled with me, but she's been brainwashed for a lot of years. Jehovah Jireh means the Lord will provide. Matter of fact, we, we saw that word uh, this week in our Bible study about Abraham. Uh, you may have a lot of needs today, but I'm going to tell you something. Uh, you don't have any greater need today than to know that God is the Redeemer, that he provided for you. You don't have any greater need than that. Your feet may be hurting today. You may have a needing of healing in your feet you might have a headache, and I'm not talking about your spouse, but you may have a headache, you may have cancer, you may have AIDS, you may have walked in here with a disease. I will tell you that the Lord God is your healer, but I want to tell you this right now. He's your redeemer. The greatest need you have more than anything else is to know that you're redeemed, that you're saved, and you're on the way to heaven. There are all kinds of things that have happened to me physically, but I'm on my way to heaven. Had I went back there a couple of years ago, and I, or whatever it was, how many years ago, and was in the hospital and I didn't think I was going to live, had I went on to be with the Lord, I'd have been okay. What's the worst the devil can do to you? Kill your body, but he can't have my spirit. My spirit belongs to God, and I'm glad of that. If we have that, if we know that we're held in our Savior's arms and that he was our great substitute and that we don't have to die and go to hell because Jesus already paid for our sins, we can make it through anything. We can make it through anything. God tested Abraham. Now listen, there's one version that said God tempted him. No, James says this. James says God is not tempted, neither tempts he any man. God will never tempt you. But will there be tests in your life? Yes. And he tested Abraham. 
And, uh, uh, and the word is test there, not tempt. So I want you to know that. And Abraham had many times of testing. Do you remember when Abraham was first called of God? He said, I want you to leave your mother. I want you to leave your father. I want you to leave your household. And I want you to follow me. I'll take you to a land. I'm not going to tell you about it now. But if you'll leave, uh, I'll, I'll show you where to go. Now, I don't know about you. But that, that requires some great faith. If God tells you to leave, but he don't tell you where you're going, that requires some faith, doesn't it? Now, he wasn't totally obedient. People say, well, Abraham was obedient. No, he wasn't. I can tell you over and over again where, where Abraham was not very obedient to God. In the first, of all, first of all, he told him to get up and leave your family. He didn't leave all his family. He took Lot with him. Now, that caused him some problems, didn't it? And uh, uh, when he got to the land that God showed him in Canaan, there was a famine there. And when he got to, saw that famine, he went down to Egypt. God didn't tell him to go to Egypt. And when he went to Egypt, that's where he gained Hagar, the slave. And because he was, they were impatient waiting on the promised child that God had said he, uh, he would have, do you know what happened? He slept with Hagar, and he had Ishmael. But Ishmael was not the promised seed. Over and over again, he was tested, and he didn't always pass the test. Can I tell you this? You're not going to pass every test. You're not going to. You're going to really screw up some things in life. You're going to look back and you're going to say, I should have done it. Well, don't do that. You can't change the past. The past is history. Tomorrow's a mystery. Let's live today. Amen? It's good to obey God. But Abraham was supposed to follow him and do exactly what he said, and many times he did, not one test after another. And even Lot was quite a test because there came a time when they knew they had to separate from each other. And this is all what we've been studying on Wednesday nights. They had to separate from each other. Their herds and flocks were too great. And so uh, Abraham went like this, said, Lot, you pick out the best land you want, and I'll take whatever's left. And so Lot chose to be close to Sodom and Gomorrah. That didn't work out very well. And God had to rescue Lot from Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, there are a lot of decisions that were made. But Abraham uh, caused some of that stuff that happened to him by taking Lot with him to begin with. He was supposed to leave his whole family there. Amen? He was tested when it came to Lot. But you know what? He rescued Lot over and over again. Thank God that God is our rescuer. And I remember when Abraham was tested again, he said, Oh, that Ishmael would live before you. And God said, No, Ishmael is not the child of promise. Another great lesson here. God's not, God's not going to change his eternal plan just because you want him to. God knows what's best for us. And he has a plan for us. We get to the place sometimes we say, I'm not sure he has a plan. I guarantee you he has a plan. He didn't cause you to be birthed into this world with no plan for your life. He has a plan for your life. You have to decide whether you're going to follow it or not. Our life doesn't end at salvation. Our life is really just beginning at salvation. And at that time there, we need to follow God wherever he leads us. And we don't really have, we, he will allow us to make stupid mistakes. But we'd be smart if we'd listen to what his words say and follow what he says. Because Abraham had made those other mistakes like getting uh, Hagar with him and sleeping with Hagar and, and having Ishmael. And then uh, God called Abraham to send Ishmael away. But I'm going to tell you, Abraham loved Ishmael. He may not have been the promised seed, but he still loved him. He was a father. And now he had to send Ishmael away. And then finally he got Isaac. Thank God he got Isaac. You know, the Bible doesn't say that God is the father of Abraham and Ishmael. He says he's the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen? The greatest test that Abraham was going to have to go through was coming up because God told him, and this is in the 22nd book of, of Genesis, God told him, take your son, your only son, and offer him on the altar sacrifice his life 
on Mount Moriah. I can't imagine what Abraham was going through at that time. He was going to be obedient to him. But listen, he had to go like this and said, You made promises. You made promises to me, God. You told me that of my seed would, would come as many as the stars are or, or as the sands beside the sea. What happens to that promise if I go up there and kill him? He had to have some of that going through his mind. But listen, when you get to the place with God that you decide whatever you want, I'll give it. What's going to happen to the promise? Listen, when God tells you to do something, don't try to figure out why. For most of us who don't have everything ticking up here like it should, if he explained it, we probably wouldn't understand it. If God explained to me everything in my life, I'd probably go, what? Well, let me say it again. What? When I get ready to go someplace at night in my truck, I turn on the lights. It don't shine all the way home. It just shines a couple hundred feet in front of my truck. That's all I need to know. All I need to know is, what is my next step, God? What is my next step? He's going to guide me. I've said it many times from this pulpit. God wants to take us from A to Z. But we didn't realize we're going to have to do B, C, D, E, F, and all the other ones, all those other steps. But you don't get to Z until you went through the other steps. Amen? Isaac was his only son. Abraham really loved Isaac. And God said, I want you, Abraham, to, to put Isaac on the altar. Can I tell you this? Just a little bit off subject, but all of you have Isaacs. They may not be children, but there's something else that you so much love that you don't want to get, a, get rid of. Can I tell you this? If you love something so much that you won't release it, you love it too much. I understand what the psalmist meant when he went like this and he said, uh, uh, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What's he really saying there? Because Jesus himself wanted food when he was hungry. He wanted drink when he was thirsty. He wanted those things. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Oh, to get to that place where God is so sufficient for us that we don't have to have anything else. He's everything to us. We have a lot of things that we love. Love our children. It would be pretty hard for us even in this day and age if God spoke. He doesn't need to do it now. But if he spoke to us, I want you to offer up your child. We love our businesses that we're involved with. We love that. You might love that boat. I mean, uh, there were times when, uh, uh, when Dave Maxwell would show me some old boat he's got, and I didn't know how he could be so thrilled about that old boat. Well, I'm not a boat guy. Probably boat guys would say, oh, that's great. I'm looking at it thinking, I'd have to haul it around, clean it. That, nah. <laughs> or that fishing rod that you love so much, or that hunting rifle that you love so much, or that motorcycle you love so much. Man, now we're getting down where the rubber meets the road, aren't we? <laughs> but you see, all of us must be willing to put our Isaacs on the altar. We've got to give our very best to God. He was called Jehovah Jireh. Abraham took his son, took a three days journey. At that time, some people want to think about, uh, uh, because he used the term lad, that he was really young. No, Isaac at that time was about 33 years old, the same age as Jesus was when he gave his life. He's a 33-year-old. You know, he had to have questions in his mind. We know he does from the Scripture. Well, here's the wood, but where's the lamb? But he went all the way up there because Abraham had gotten to the place where he actually believed God. Did you know many times we say we really believe God until there's a test? Well, I love you, Lord, and, and I really believe in you, and I, I do anything, but I didn't know you wanted that. We've got to give our very best to God. So Abraham takes his son, 
And Abraham li lifted that knife, bound the wood on Isaac, and made him carry it up that hill, that mountain, and then put him on the altar, put wood under, uh, wood under there, lifted the knife to kill him. But you know, right about now, he has to be saying, this don't make sense. I'm going to tell you something. God will ask you to do a lot of things that don't make any human sense at all. He asks you wives to forgive your husband just one more time. That don't make any sense. We, I didn't really mean that because we all know husbands never make mistakes. There are times when God is calling you and saying, listen, you left this debt unpaid. And he says, pay that debt. You know, uh, 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 I know there are extenuating circumstances, but I've never had very much respect for somebody that has money and wastes it on something else but doesn't pay their debt. I don't get that. Do you get that? How many people know the most honest people full of integrity ought to be Christians? We're setting examples for people. I remember my kids have, have worked uh, in restaurants when they were going to college and stuff, and the reputation of Christians is they didn't really want them to come in and, uh, and sit down and eat because they left the most horrible tips. Well, what kind of example is that? Let me go ahead and tell you, tip abundantly. God has blessed you abundantly. Tip abundantly. Blow their minds. Don't just leave a little track there trying to lead them to Jesus and and. A dime. Leave them a track in ten dollars. That'll make more of an impression on them. After he lifted that knife, God said, "Abraham, Abraham, don't lay your hand on that child." I don't know if Abraham was going. Boy, it's about time you got involved. No. <laughs> Listen, God will save your Isaac if you'll give your Isaac to him. He'll give it back to you. When God requires something from you that seems like it's an outrageous requirement, I guarantee you, you'll never come out on the losing end of that if you'll release it to him. I had a guy come up to me one time and he told me, he said, Pastor, you'd have more money if you quit giving cars and motorcycles and stuff like that away. And I looked at him, I said, I know you don't understand this, but no, I wouldn't. Be an extravagant giver. Amen? Amen. And so Abraham turned around and there was a ram caught by his horns in there. And Abraham took that ram and offered him instead of Isaac. And he called that place Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider. Because God provided the sacrifice. Amen? And he didn't have to take his son. You see, when Isaac took that load of wood upon him going up that mountain, he had the load on him. He was headed for the judgment of God. He was headed for death. That's the way you and I are. We, we were under a load of sin. We were under the load of guilt and condemnation. Without Jesus, we're headed for the judgment of God. But thank God for Jehovah Jireh, who provided a lamb to take our place. The Lamb of God. Now, he was speaking prophetically there. We know he was. Because what was provided instead of Isaac wasn't a lamb, but a ram. So he know, we know he was speaking into the future when God would provide the Lamb of God for us. Amen? God will provide. He not only provided the Lamb, he provided the mountain, he provided the earth that, 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 that held the altar, he provided everything we have is provided by God. Some of you out here today may be wondering, I'm going through a tight situation in my finances, but I'm here to tell you that you may try to figure out, figure the thing out in your natural mind, but 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 I don't 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 be offended. You ain't smart enough. You're not smart enough to work out all that stuff. Thank God that His guidance can bring us right where He wants us. Thank God. Well, if I was just a little better and could quit this and quit that, then I know that I'd be all right with God. And I've told people this before. Several times I've had to say this. They'll say, they'll say Billy Graham's in heaven because of all the good things he did. No, he's in heaven because of the goodness of God. 
Nobody's in heaven because of how good they are. But they're in heaven because of how good God is. Because God provided the lamb. We deserve death. We deserve destruction because of the sin in our life. But rather than us dying, Jesus died in our place. God will provide the lamb. Behold the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That's what John said as he saw Jesus coming up over the hill. Isaiah said it like this. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Talking about Jesus. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no former comeliness. Uh, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty in him that we should desire him. Then it says, Surely he hath borne our sicknesses and our pains. The chastisement of our peace is upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. I just want to tell you that when he hung upon that cross, mm, he took my guilt. He took my sin. You know what? It, he, he took my condemnation. Did you know what else he did? He took all the murder of murderers. He took the rape of the rapists. He took the incest of incestuous. He took all the blaspheme. He took all the weird things that human race could do. And he took it onto himself on that cross. He suffered for me. He suffered for you. He took our place. Our place. Oh, to get a revelation that if he took it, we shouldn't be suffering with it. He took it. He died for sinners. Christ died instead of the sinner. Christ died instead of the ungodly. That's what's happening on the cross. As he hung there, the object of all the prophecies pointed to him, fulfilling everything the prophets had ever said, changing the world by what he's doing on that cross. The earth that he made, that he created, begins to tremble. He made the earth, and now it's holding him on that cross. The Bible says there was an earthquake. There was trembling. My, the Bible says the angels watched in astonishment. Matter of fact, the Bible says that they would inquire about these things. Why? They don't understand salvation. The angels that fell, that were cast down from heaven, there's no salvation provided for them. Salvation is for human beings, for people like you and me. Turn to your neighbor and say, you know, you're a nasty old thing. But, but God loves you. Jesus died for you. Get away from somehow thinking that you deserve salvation. You don't deserve it. But it is a gift. The Bible says the angels watching the sun, they didn't understand. They desired to look into it, but they didn't get it. He endured uh, 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 the trembling. He wants us to live a life without trembling. He endured the darkness that came on there because he wants us to live a life without darkness. One of the astonishing things to me is when Jesus said, My God, my God, why, why have you forsaken me? Which is a fulfillment of prophecy. But he had to turn his face away from Jesus because at that point there, Jesus had all the sin of mankind upon him. He forsook Jesus, oh my goodness, so that you and I would never be forsaken. He turned his face away from his only son so that you and I would never have God's face turned away from us. He died under the judgment of God. So you and I wouldn't have to experience the judgment of God. He died to pay our debt. A debt that we owed. But he didn't owe that debt. He just paid it for us. Why should I be in darkness if he went through the darkness for me? Why should I be forsaken when he was forsaken for me? What a message to tell the world. 
What did Jesus say? For God so loved the world. Everybody shout, that's me. Shout it out loud, that's me. For God so loved every human being on earth that would ever be born. And he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And the verse after that says, God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He didn't come to condemn you. He came to love you. Oh, my gosh. If you get up in the morning and you go look in the mirror, one of the first things that ought to uh, uh, occur to you is, you love that? <laughs> he came to stand beside you. He came to save you. And the greatest thing you could ever do is, is to make him the Lord of your life because he is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider. Now the question is, not what you will do with bobcats, not what you'll do with the heart of God. Not what will you do with the church down the street or the preacher that you're mad at or disappointed in. Some relative that's supposed to be a Christian doesn't live right. The question is, what will you do with Jesus? That's the most important question you'll ever answer. Jesus said, and if I be lifted up, I'll draw them into myself. He's going to draw every human being to give an account of what he did. Oh, today, I want to invite you. That if you don't know Jesus, I think I know everybody in this place. But did you know, I, I told this at the funeral yesterday, you don't know if I'm saved. You don't know that. Your relationship with God is a personal thing. I don't know if you're saved. In the kingdom of God, just because it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, doesn't really mean it's a duck. Because people can get very good by putting on acts. But today I invite you to make Jesus the Lord of your life. I don't care if you've been in, in the church your whole life. I don't want you to lean on what, you, what, what you've done already or what you've heard already. People are surprised sometimes when I tell them, I don't even care what you were taught when you were young. I don't care about that. I'm going to teach you the truth. I want you to pray this with me. Say, oh God, I know I'm a sinner. I know that without Jesus, I'm lost. God, I need something in my life. Jesus, I heard about you today. And I believe you rose from the dead. And I ask you to come into my heart. And I ask you to save me today, Lord. I want you to lift this load off of me. I want you to come in and give me peace. And I want to tell you, if you meant that when you prayed that, then he's your Jehovah Jireh because he has provided a sacrifice for you. Hallelujah. 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 Are you glad? Are you glad there's a, a Lord that took your place? Are you glad there's a church you can come through with all your problems and still be loved on? Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Let's stand to our feet. We're going to take communion. I'm very glad we started taking communion every week. We need to remember the blood that was shed for our sins and the body that was broken that we might have eternal life. And the other thing that we need to remember is the outfit that Lee has on. I've never seen a, an adult onesie and it's a chief's onesie. Thank you. I want to remind you that Tuesday night is our men's meeting at my house. We really have a good time there, guys. If you haven't been, you need to come.
You ought to be getting pretty adept now moving that little film off the top to get the wafer. There's nothing you can do to earn salvation, but there's something you have to do to get this wafer out. You got to work for it. Somebody told me the other day, Pastor, I really miss the oyster crackers. Well, <laughs> hallelujah. I remember when Paul the Apostle in the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians, he said, for I, I, for I delivered unto you that which I received from the Lord, that on a night that he uh, was betrayed, he took bread and broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. And then, he, then he took the cup and he said, this is a cup of the new covenant in my blood. Uh, uh, do this as often you in remembrance of me. So we're going to take it, first of all, take the, hold the bread in your hand and say this. You can say it along with me. It's up there on the screen. Thank you, Jesus, for your broken body. It is for my healing, my spouse's healing, my children's healing. Thank you that by your stripes, by the beatings you bore, by the lashes which fell on your back, we are completely healed. I believe and I receive. Break and eat it. The first physical illustration I saw that was many years ago at a motorcycle camp. We went through this and somebody brought unleavened bread, which you can't hardly chew. And while he was chewing it, Paul Church got out of his wheelchair and started walking because by his stripes were healed. The broken body brought healing. Next, take the cup in your hand and say this. Thank you, Jesus. Say it with me. For the covenant cut in your blood, your blood hath brought me forgiveness, washed me from every sin. I thank you that your blood has made me righteous. And as I drink, I celebrate and partake of the inheritance of the righteous, which is preservation, healing, wholeness, and prosperity. Drink. I thank you, Jesus. I love you because you first loved me. Well, I hope you enjoyed the service. I hope it built you up and it gave you and gave you strength. I always tell people that there will be a test. Anytime you hear the word, there's a test. You get to go find out uh, uh, if you really heard this word when you start living life. Amen. <laughs> Father, I speak a blessing on everyone here. Business, home, social, physical, mental, and spiritual. Pour out your love, your power, your grace in such a mighty way that when the rest of the world sees them, they'll say, surely these people have been with Jesus.